All right. So we're slowly going to let people come in as they come flying in. But uh, good evening, everyone. Um, good morning, Jody. <laughs> and welcome to the third of the bi weekly CUBE seminar series that we're hosting in 2021 uh, virtually versus in person. And uh, I just want to note that. Uh, Thank you everyone for joining us as well as um, keeping yourself muted during the presentation and your camera off. And if you have any questions, uh, Joey's uh, welcome to answer them at the end of the uh, presentation. So you can use the chat box for that. And as noted, we are recording this event and it will be available on our YouTube channel and we'll let everyone who registered know when it becomes available. And with that, I We'll introduce our CUBE's director, Stephen, Dr. Stephen Lockheed, um, who will uh, do our land acknowledgement and welcome Jody. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. So <clears throat> I wish to begin by acknowledging that these traditional territories of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee have a very long human history, one vastly predating the establishment of the earliest European settlements. This territory has significance for the indigenous peoples who lived and continue to live on it and whose practices, culture, knowledge and spiritualities were and are tied to this land and we're grateful to, to live here. Um, so turning to an introduction and I, I won't make this over long Jody, it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Jody Rowley to the Queen's University Biological Station, at least virtually. Jody is a conservation biologist and herpetologist whose research and practice is focused on amphibians and their conservation. Uh, she has led many expeditions in search of amphibians in Australia and Southeast Asia and co-discovered more than 30 frog species new to science. I have discovered exactly zero. So that impresses me. Uh, she is currently curator of amphibian and reptile conservation biology at the Australian Museum and the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. I met Jody last year <clears throat> at the World Congress of Herpetology in Dunedin, New Zealand, where she gave a terrific and captivating plenary lecture. And after I saw it, I approached her and invited her to come to CUBES uh, to, to come last summer. Um, but as you know, well, the pandemic happened and that was not to happen. So for now, we have to settle for a virtual Jody, but hope that we will indeed be able to uh, welcome her to our station in the future. Uh, today, Jody will speak on the impacts of the bushfires in Australia and the value of citizen science projects, which she has been instrumental in, in engaging in. So I'll turn it over to you, Jody. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you very much. I'll just share my screen um, button share and how is that you guys can see that okay yep looks great oh awesome thank you so much uh well thank you for your introduction thank you for having me virtually um with you i do really hope one day to to come and visit and see some of the amazing uh amphibians and reptiles in your neck of the woods um and and certainly i invite you to come to, to sydney sometime as well when um when when that's a thing again um but in the meantime um yeah it's, it's an absolute pleasure to to speak today thank you so much uh so probably most of you have heard about the bushfires that, that hit australia in 2019 2020 um it was sort of i guess preceded though um by a, a really strong drought throughout most of australia uh, and particularly in Eastern Australia. And in September 2019, uh, I was out at the Macquarie Marshes, which is a really, really important uh, sort of, I guess, ephemeral um, wetland system, but usually there is some amount of water. And it was terrifying to go to these places and, and places where it's definitely not always flooded. It's definitely not always full of water, um, but there was absolutely no water. There was this tiny little green bit of water and, and all of the animals around um, that we actually managed to see were really suffering and the frogs were, were largely absent. Shortly after that, I went on a rescue mission actually for an endangered frog, the Burlong frog, uh, 
Um, believe it or not, running through the middle of that slide is a stream or was a stream or should be a stream, um, but that was, it was completely gone. Um, and the Burralong frog, which is in the, the bottom um, left of your screen there, um, is very, very sensitive and cannot handle strength drying out like this um, and so this frog was actually rescued from this site and is now in a captive breeding population and hopefully can um, be reintroduced to these streams in the future as they recover but you can also see uh, a little bit of a haze in the background and this was actually the beginning of the bushfires that um, we all saw and experienced and so it was it was really smoggy um, and so I guess a lot of Eastern Australia was used to wearing face masks before COVID hit because of the smoke in, in the sky. And, and then the fires really got going. Um, I thankfully wasn't too close to any of the fires, but even as, as we went to the World Congress in January, the smoke followed us. It was, it was incredibly, um, I guess, terrifying. And it was something that we hadn't really seen on such a scale before. The scale and intensity was, was kind of out of control. Um, and I was watching the news and breathing the smoke and imagining all the frogs in the forests uh, that I'd been surveying for, for many, many years, just completely disappearing. I didn't know what to expect. And in fact, from September 2019 to January 2020, more than 17 million hectares of forest burnt. Um, and you can see this map of Australia and all the grey areas are areas that burnt. And I guess fires are a part of Australia's ecosystems. Many of Australia's ecosystems and Australian wildlife has evolved to deal with fire, particularly in the north where annual fires are quite common. So um, they weren't the alarming ones, but it was these high intensity, large scale fires in southeastern Australia that you can see in grey there that were I guess it was it was completely unprecedented. So we had no idea how the, the, the animals were going to respond at all. Um, and there was a you know a lot of a lot of mammals, mammals in particular that were rescued and, and it was it was pretty horrific um, times, not to mention the impact on people's property and um, and and lives. Now in true Australian fashion, shortly after the fires, just as they started sort of to so I guess and partially this is one of the reasons that they kind of petered off. Um, we went into uh, floods. So um, in February, it poured with rain. Um, we were super happy to, to actually get the rain after so long, after the drought, after the fires. And now was the time to go look for frogs. So I did manage to get out. These are some of the, in the Blue Mountains, uh, just west of Sydney. Um, I managed to get into some frog habitat um, and it did look pretty terrifying, I've got to say. Um, it was not the, the habitat that I was used to seeing and it just stretched for, you know, miles and miles. Um, but when I got into some of the sites, this was in the New England Tablelands of New South Wales, got out of the car um, in the forest, I was actually really, really surprised and really happy to actually hear the um, all of these frog calls, actually, and in fact, more frog calls in this particular place than I'd actually ever uh, heard at this site. Um, and underneath this log was like a tiny little frog. This is the red-backed toadlet that breeds in leaf litter. And under, you can see the black, like you sort of burnt logs these frogs were breeding. And so I was pretty excited. These, are, these aren't a threatened frog, but certainly they were in the highest severity fire areas and these little dudes survived, which was some, some pretty good news. Uh, and then we went down into some rainforest streams that were burnt. And this is a pile of rocks. Um, and you can see that, you know, it's been a little while since the, the fires, the rain appeared, it had been about a month. Um, and if, you, you can kind of see the little snout of a frog pointing down. Um, we found these endangered barred frogs and uh, probably partially because there was not a lot of vegetation, it was quite easy to see the frogs, but I saw more frogs there of this endangered species than I'd seen in, in a while, which was some good news. And it was obvious as well, um, you, you might not be able to see, but this is another, another southern barred frog. 
just on his elbow, um, he's got little burns. So a lot of the frogs you could actually see where they were hiding. So this guy must have been hiding in the base of a tree and, and he did definitely get some, some heat and, and frogs definitely would have died. Um, but he managed to survive along with a lot of his friends, which was, was some heartening news. So I was really keen to get out there. I was really keen to survey, to study the impacts of these fires on frogs after my, my little quick trip to have a look at things. And the rest of Australia, and, and we were all really struggling to try and prioritise what to do. Um, so we we making guesses rather than based upon data, but estimating that about 119 species um, of amphibian and reptile, um, also 23 amphibian and reptile, reptile species, 16 frog species were identified as having the highest priority for management intervention. Um, and this was essentially done though in a kind of the simplest manner, which was looking at the range of the species and plotting the fire extent. Um, so for example, things like the glandular tree frog, which is range is in red. When you plot the, the fire over it, you see that a large percentage of its range was actually burnt. So the New England tree frog was identified as a priority species. And, and same thing with the stuttering tree, uh, the stuttering frog or the southern barred frog, Mixithes balbus, a lot of its range was burnt. So these were identified as some species that we really needed to get out there and do post-fire monitoring to understand how this impacted them. But then of course this thing hit. Um, so in March, essentially, just as we were getting ready to go out and start these surveys and understand how frogs were doing, uh, we were not able to. So we were on lockdown for several months, um, actually probably not allowed to do field work and get out to places for a lot longer. And so there was reports in the media of, um, you know, are we actually going to be able to, to sort of discover the impacts that these fires are having on biodiversity. So would we be able to figure out what was happening to all these species and all these streams um, and, and across Australia um, if we were all a scientist stuck at home and not able to get out? Well, for frogs, the answer was yes. And this was because of a national citizen science project that I'm the lead scientist for, Frog ID. So this project was launched before the fires. We had no idea that it would be so important in understanding the impact of the fires on frog diversity across Australia. Um, uh, but it has actually proved to be the best information that we have on the impact of fires on Australian frogs. What is Frog ID though? So as I said, a national citizen science project, so across Australia, it's all based around a free app for your smartphone. It's a field guide so you can learn all about your local frogs or frogs across Australia, look at photos, listen to calls. But the main thing is that you are, are, it's a tool to monitor frogs. And it's all based around the fact that frogs call. Each species, and we've got about 243 species in Australia, makes a unique advertisement call. And so just by pressing record for 20 to 60 seconds, um, those recordings then get uploaded with the GPS data, um, the time, the date, and, and other information if you want, notes, photos, things like that. And these recordings um, then are unfortunately not yet a Shazam, so they're not machine identified. They're actually listened to by a team of experts, including myself. So these recordings, um, this is a particular recording on the content management system that we see. So as validators, when we're listening to all these frog calls submitted from across Australia, um, we get the audio files, all the data associated with it. This is a red back toadlet that I recorded in a, um, a stream where no, rec no records of frogs previously existed. I didn't have mobile phone reception. Um, but phones still know where they are, which is fantastic. So I uploaded that later once I got into mobile phone reception. Um, and it was super easy as well. So instead of the usual, uh, you know, writing down what you, you see, what you hear, um, it's just kind of automatic. So I just press record while I'm kind of walking along. Um, and then that forms a biodiversity record, which is, which is pretty easy um, and pretty great. So we launched Frog ID in November 2017. The fires weren't until 2019. So we had a couple of years of, of data. Now we're at over three and a half years. And so just to give you an idea of, of amazingly how uh, successful the, the project has been, um, 
not when people get emails, I should say that. Um, we so far have had uh, over 150,000 people across Australia download the Frog ID app. And we've had oh, almost 23,000 people submit an audio file. Um, so be registered and submit an audio file um, to, to Frog ID. Uh, now there are a few that are insects, so it's, it's not all frogs. Um, but out of the 236,000 audio files submitted, we have over 380,000 records of frogs. So the average number of frog species calling per recording is more than two. And we've had up to 12 frog species calling in one audio recording, which is pretty amazing. And out of the 234 or so species of frog in Australia, Frog ID has documented 204 of those species. And you can see it is a little bit of a population map of Australia. Um, so most of the humans live along the coast um, and there are a lot of Australia where we still don't have uh, frog ID records. And that's typical of a citizen science project, but we do have some amazing recordings from amazing places as well. Now this volume of frog records, so about 382,000 frog records at the moment, that is represents about 75% of all other frog records in Australia. So if you look at everything that's not frog ID and there's a record of a frog for the last 240 or so years in Australia, many of them with, I guess, various uh, issues, precision issues, um, we have all, uh, we have about 75% of all the data that was, was previously around on frogs. So it really has revolutionized our understanding of frogs across Australia. The project is also going in, I guess, leaps and, and bounds, puns intended. So the number of submissions, while there certainly is, uh, I guess, a spring summer peak when it tends to be Eastern Australia is the best time um, for frogs at that time. Um, we, we are increasing in, term, in terms of the number of submissions that we're receiving over time, which is really exciting. And it's allowing us to get a much finer detail of day to day and, and across Australia, how frogs are doing. Not all frogs are recorded equally though. So certainly some frogs have only been recorded once or twice. And this little guy here, Crinia signifera, or the common Eastern froglet, it's a very small frog. It's about two centimeters. It sounds like an insect, sort of a, a cricket, more like meh, 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 meh. This guy has uh, been recorded almost 60,000 times um, across Australia, which is, is pretty insane. So one of the, the most, I guess, um, important things about frog ID to me as well was how non-invasive it was. When you look at photographs of frogs in iNaturalist, they're often being handled. Um, and in fact, many frog species look so similar that it is very difficult to tell them apart by photographs. Um, you might need to look at the webbing between their toes or the color on their thighs and things like that that actually do require handling. And especially when it comes to disease, we don't want people to be grabbing one frog um, and then touching another frog and giving, you know, transferring disease across animals. So um, that's one of the most amazing things. And it, it also lets us properly kind of understand the little frogs that most people wouldn't see. I've probably heard thousands and thousands of common eastern froglets, but I've only ever seen probably less than 20 in my whole life. They are really hard to find even if you're looking for them, but they're easy to hear and people don't need to get their feet wet. They don't need to get in wetlands. So it is a, a pretty non-invasive way to, to understand um, how our frogs are doing across time and space. And the kind of things that we're sort of helping understand due to the frog ID are, are quite diverse. So you can go to the, the frog ID website and have a look at some of the papers that we've been publishing. But for example, we're actually revealing where frogs are disappearing. So the good old green tree frog, which is a, a popular pet in North America um, and actually in Australia as well, 
uh, we've realised that in Sydney, where I am, it used to be really, really common. There are historical documents saying there's hundreds of these guys calling in ponds in the middle of the city. Um, and of course, uh, the city's changed in the last hundred or, or so years, and these guys have actually disappeared. We don't fully understand yet why, um, but they have almost completely disappeared from Sydney. And so now we can try and use Frog ID as well to understand what's going on um, and what we need to do to maybe bring them back as well. We're getting a lot of really good threatened species records, particularly when local communities are using frog ID as a tool to study their local threatened frog. Uh, and the, the little brown frog in the, the picture on the threatened species record is the Sloan's toadlet. Um, and Sloan's froglet, sorry. Um, and this guy lives around Albury, which is a city in New South Wales in Victoria. Um, it calls in the middle of winter and it looks almost identical to that common eastern frog, but the, one of the most common frogs. But instead of going, rat, 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 this guy is called kind of like, eh, eh. Um, and so local communities are getting out there in the middle of winter and they've probably uh, already um, doubled several times over the number of frog records we have of this species, um, you know, than ever we ever had before, which is quite amazing just using frog ID. We're also looking at the impacts of land use change and then a couple of papers have come out recently using frog ID data uh, to demonstrate things like, you know, 70% of all the frogs that we studied that we had enough data from frog ID actually were intolerant of human modification. So we're more common in, in unmodified habitats than, than modified and that in urban areas, uh, there is less than half the species as there is in the adjacent non-urban areas as well. So now we're trying to look at, at what we can do to, I guess, increase frog diversity within urban areas. We're also tracking invasive species. Australia has one species uh, of invasive amphibian and that is the cane toad. And so we're understanding, getting a better understanding of where these leading edges of invasion are. We're discovering new species. So a lot of these we have hunches or we have genetic data that they actually are different species, that it's likely to be, you know, one pointy brown frog is, is might be different in one part of Australia to the other. Um, but now we're also getting these calls and we're able to use these calls to, to help, I guess, prove that they are undescribed species and also figure out where, where they are distributed and how they're doing. And we're looking at the impacts of climate change. So drought and what I will be talking a little bit more about is the impact of fires. So after the fires, um, I, you know, I, I was stuck. I, I couldn't get out there. Uh, but what was really amazing was that people were out there. These photographs were taken by frog ID users in habitats where they were recording frogs. So you can see they were out there. There was people across Australia. And what we did really quickly as well was in the first couple of months after fire was we like, right, you know, everyone's making these guesses. Everyone's prioritizing different frog species just based upon range overlap. What we really need to do is get something out as quickly as possible with all the data that amazing people across the fire front are actually providing us. So we looked at just up to 125 days post fire and just in that southeastern area that had experienced so much uh, devastation um, from the fires. And we used frog ID data combined with remote sensing data. So one of these is um, uh, national hotspot data and there are satell satellites passing over Aus Australia that record sort of in, in grids uh, the temperature um, of, of that area and provide kind of a, a hot a, a temperature record. Um, and so by using those records, we're able to get an understanding of when the fire front passed over. So the fires went for several months. Some started uh, much earlier than others. Um, some were, were later. And so to get an understanding of what was before and after fire, we use this, as well as these layers that showed where the fire actually was. So we got an understanding of all the frog records before the fire and all the frog records after the fire across that eastern area. And just in 125 days post fire, there were more than 400 people um, that had recorded frogs either before or after the fire. 
um, we had about 1,600 pre-fire records and over 600 post-fire records of 45 species. So just this really quick snapshot we managed to, to have a look at. And we found actually that a lot of frog species were calling some of them very, very soon, even a day or two after the fire as well. And of course, that was more likely in areas really frogs started calling when it actually started really raining in February. So we got a good understanding of what frogs had persisted in these burnt areas. Um, and looking at frogs that we recorded at these sites, by we, I mean people across Australia, before the fire and after the fire, we found no missing species, no obvious missing species. So um, if a frog had more than frog five records before the fire, it was also found after the fire, which was some really, really good news. And so we kind of got this great early idea of, you know what, at least some species, probably not all species, but there is persistence. We don't know how long this you know, the long-term impacts, but we can demonstrate that there is sort of short-term persistence, widespread persistence in Australian frogs, which was some really good news. Trying to have a look uh, at which species were, was there any characteristics of the species, whether they were stream breeding, permanent breeding, ephemeral breeding, um, arboreal, terrestrial burrowing, we didn't find a huge pattern, but we only had that, that small amount of data. And this was the first thing we just wanted to get out there and, and show, but it seemed like frogs kind of across the board were really, really quite tolerant. Um, and in some respects, it makes sense because uh, if you're adapted to drought, then you're probably going to be adapted to fires. Um, and a lot of the frog species in Australia are in quite dry, or, or I guess areas that can be quite dry or prone to, prone to drought and also have evolved with fire. Um, one thing to, to really point out here though, is that there are these remote and um, rainforest adapted frogs that live in, in a very small parts um, of, of Australia in really wet rainforest and some of these areas burn. These aren't the kind of frogs that are monitored well by Frog ID because people are really up in these places, um, uh, the general public. So these frogs require intensive scientific study, which is, is happening at the moment. And so this was great news, uh, but I wanted to actually get out there as well and, and have a look with my own eyeballs. Uh, and so when we were finally allowed, so from September 2020, we were allowed to get out in the field. I got out as quickly as I could and I wanted to see whether these, these you know, these frogs really were there. So after February where I'd seen some persisting, had they survived the winter, how were they doing now? Um, and this is a, a, in the northern tablelands of New South Wales. This would have been rainforest. No, I guess it will be again. It still is. It's just very burnt. Um, so in September, we got out um, and we were really, really delighted to see and hear two of those priority species. So the southern barred frog and the New England tree frog were still around, which was really great. And even better than that, the streams were just absolutely full of tadpoles of these endangered frogs. So clearly they had not only had the frogs managed to survive at least that winter, but they've also had success. And even in these streams that were full of ash, um, you know, there, there was a lot of tadpoles, which was really fantastic news. And since then, we have been doing structured surveys in search of some of these priority frogs and, and people across Australia have been doing the same thing. We've just been a small part of it at the Australian Museum. And from our surveys anyway, it, it is, still good news. We still don't know the long-term implications and obviously there's all sorts of interactions with disease and, and habitat loss, but it seems like it's not as devastating. The impact of these fires have not been as devastating on all frog species anyway, including some of these threatened species that are sort of identified as a priority, as I thought. Um, and as we thought as a whole, you know, when I was watching the news, I just imagined all these frogs evaporating and disappearing from these streams in such high intensity fires. But um, this, this has given me hope um, and the combination of frog ID and the surveys that we've been doing um, has surprisingly to me revealed how resilient our frogs can be. Of course, we're just hitting them with 3000 things at once. And that's one of, one of the biggest problems.
So yeah, a year on, we're looking at frog ID data. So we've got several research papers underway. And so far, the preliminary sort of um, statistics that are coming out of these is that there is no change in the diversity of frogs or species richness of frogs pre and post fire using frog ID. And the continued surveys, which my colleagues have been leading, have been revealing these tadpoles have now turned into to baby frogs and our fingers crossed that, that these frogs are able to recover or even boom a little bit in, in the really good rainy season we had this summer. Now, as I mentioned, frog ID data is, is not reflective of some of these really amazing old species like the, the mountain frog. Um, Floria Kandagunga, these guys live in habitats that have not burnt in, in the past on an evolutionary scale. And so the impact of, of these fires is unknown, but being studied. But what has, I guess, uh, Frog ID has done is that not only has it provided the information and the best information that we have in Australia at the moment um, on frogs in terms of their, their response to bushfires, drought and, and habitat change. It's also given me a huge amount of hope um, because I mean, in the face of these wildfires, in the face of everything that's going on, sometimes as a conservation biologist, it can be really, really depressing. And you think, you know, look, the, you know, I don't know that we're gonna be able to get through this. Um, you know, it, it's, it's all too much, it's really depressing. Um, but what Frog ID has taught me is that people are willing to get out there in the rain, in a swamp, after the fires, um, in the middle of winter, and record frog calls. And it's not just a few people as well, it's, it's tens of thousands of people across Australia that have been using Frog ID and have been getting so much amazing information on Australia's frogs. Uh, and so I think it is really fantastic and provides a lot of hope, not only for frogs, but for biodiversity in general, that, that we aren't alone, that there are an army of people across the world that are willing to join the fight to, to save our frogs and save our biodiversity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jody. That was a wonderful talk. Um, if any of you have questions for Jody, just pop it into the chat and uh, I will ask it in my sonorous, sleepy voice. Um, or if you want, uh, just pop pop your video on and uh, and ask Jody directly either way. But how about I lead off? You, you alluded to the fact that you don't yet have call recognition built into this, but you have all of these experts, including yourself, who are IDing this wonderful catalog of, of calls from across Australia. Are you working on some uh, um, call recognition so you'll ultimately be able to automate the whole show? Yeah, we are, we are definitely investigating it. Uh, so I guess one of the biggest challenges in, in call recognition is having that training database. Yeah. And now given that we have, you know, almost 300,000 audio files of frogs, we have a really great database of these frog calls to help with the training. Um, and we're certainly hoping that we can at least use it alongside um, the public, maybe public validation as well. So we're really keen to get more of, I guess, like an iNaturalist system where if three people say, you know, if you, you guys all listen to the frog calls. And if you say, you know, three people say the same thing, then we, we get it um, published without an expert listening to it. Um, I don't think in the near future that machine learning or artificial intelligence is going to be able to identify every frog um, and every recording. You know, our recordings are often not the best quality. Uh, you know, someone's walking along, there's, there's wind, there's several frog species calling. One might be in the foreground, one might be in the background. Um, and so it, it is really tricky. I think there'll always be a human element. And um, well, certainly we, we hope to have a, a lot of it to be machine learned in the past. I don't think it, in the future, I don't think it will be every call for sure. Um, it's right. really, really tricky, you know, and fr frogs don't always have stereotypical calls. You know, frog, frogs can, yeah, 
be pretty awful in that regard. Um, so we're, we're working on public validation and machine learning into the future, um, but there probably always will be a human element. And there's also kind of nice. So people write comments to us, we reply. So they might have specific questions about the frogs. And one of the biggest feedback that we get is that people really enjoy having that direct contact with the frog expert as well to ask questions. So I think it'll be some kind of hybrid of all of, all of the above in the future. Right. Thank you. Um, there are a few calls in the chat here. I'll just read them out. Uh, this is from Leslie. You have shown that most or all species have survived. Do you have any idea of numbers uh, or whether they are reduced? And if so, by how much? We don't. So I, we've been at the Australian Museum, we've been doing some surveys and it seems like potentially they've actually increased a lot. It's going to be really, really hard to tease out the impacts of the drought which seriously impacted the frogs and then the fire, which obviously impacted the frogs. And then we had this really fantastic wet season, um, which, you know, all the frogs seem to just do really, really well. Um, we, we're working on it, so it is a work in progress, but certainly it doesn't seem like the, the abundance is down on the species that we've been studying, but there are separate teams of people across Australia studying different species and that's probably not the case in, in all instances. And of course, there's likely to be really subtle impacts as well. There's no doubt frogs died. How's that gonna affect their genetics into the future and their ability to withstand the next fire or, or the next drought? Um, so it's, I guess, I don't wanna say that the, you know, fires are fine, it's, it's not gonna, you know, it's not a problem at all, but certainly it's not as terrible for all species as I was expecting. And it actually seems like some species are, are doing fine after these fires, which is great news. Great, thank you. This is a question from Marco, um, and he's interested in uh, your ideas on how the different species of frogs, which obviously have very different life histories, but how they their survival strategies in the fire, how do they make it through? We don't really know. Um, we think that a lot of the frogs would be sheltering already because it was such awful drought conditions. Uh, and a lot of the frogs, we do have a lot of burrowing frogs, even in these wetter ecosystems. And there's, there's a fair bit of data to show that even five to 10 centimetres underground, you're buffered from that extreme heat. Uh, certainly the southern barred frogs that we saw underneath rock piles and in the bases of trees, where they were emerging was probably where they were previously hiding when the fires went. And you could see that some of them had these burns. Um, we, we don't know about tree frogs, you know, what, what happened to them up, up, if they were up in the canopy, if they were in trees, in the tree holes and how they fared. Um, but certainly some survived. Um, but I guess, yeah, the answer is we don't know for most, most species. There's been some work done, uh, I think in, in Africa, in, in some of the grasslands, where if you play the call of the, the sound of fire, frogs will actually flee. Um, and so that's pretty amazing. Um, and so potentially, uh, frogs, particularly in ecosystems that do experience fire at regular intervals might actually sort of actively um, avoid it as, mu as much as they can. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from two people. I'll combine it into a single question from Sonia and Shelley. Um, what was the best way of communicating the Frog ID app? How did you get it out there? Uh, and get buy-in for users to register and use it because you've had such tremendous success? Um, I, I think it, people want to help. And I especially think sort of you, they, you know, everyone feels helpless in some of these things like the bushfires. So I think um, it, it was partly that. Um, a lot of promotion, so TV, radio, getting the word out. Um, and, you know, you don't want to just kind of, I guess the other benefit of Frog ID is not just getting people that were already interested in frogs out there recording frogs, it's connecting people that might never have thought about frogs, might never have realised that noise in their backyard is a frog calling, um, getting them connected with frogs. So, yeah, it was a lot of radio, PR, and, and, and every year we have Frog ID week. Um, and that's when, you know, there's a, a big push with, with sort of media getting our partner museums across Australia to promote it, um, spreading the word on social media, TV, radio, that kind of thing. Um, so a lot of, I guess, marketing um, and getting the word out. And I think it's, it's switched a little. Like, uh, I think I, I harassed most people at the World Congress because a lot of herpetologists weren't using frog ID. They thought, well, I know what that frog is. 
I don't need to record the frog or that's Jodie's project and, and you know, I, or why would I give her data when I'm doing my own work? And I think these bushfires in particular have turned things around a bit and there's a lot more respect and, and people realising, oh, like I can also use frog ID for my research. I can uh, ask for the data, which people are doing. I can use the data. I can get communities near the frogs that I'm studying to get out there and survey. Um, and frog ID is now also listed in, in guidelines, government guidelines for surveying threatened species and in conservation assessments for threatened frogs. They recommend that frog ID be used um, to monitor frogs. So I think it, it's had a little pivot and, and we'll, we'll also be hopefully getting a lot more scientists, consultants, things like that using it. Um, but I think the general public, yeah, frogs are awesome. Frog ID is easy to use. You don't have to, you know, figure out the eBird I have problems with because I can't identify birds. So I feel like I'm just adding noise to the database. But just because you have to just press record for 20 or 60 seconds, you don't even need to know if it is a frog or an insect or a bird. It is pretty easy to do. Um, and yeah, I, I, yeah, I guess people care, um, which is awesome. That's nice. I think having a, such a compelling spokesperson probably helps too, Jody. but anyway. Um, and I guess Sonia had an, a, a parallel question is, are others trying to emulate this for other species groups like birds, for example, you mentioned? Um, I'd say so. Um, and certainly we're also keen to uh, eventually expand Frog ID into other countries as well. So there might be a Frog ID Canada at some point. Um, and and we'd be really keen, you know, this model's worked so well. Um, you know, I love our, our naturalists and things like that too. And when I see frogs or particularly plants, because I know what plants are, but I, you know, I often take photographs of, of plants and that's also been really important in helping understand the impact of fires on other diversity. Um, but yeah, we're, we're keen to to expand frog ID out because it is such a great a great way to monitor frogs. Um. <clears throat> yeah, we only have twenty five species of frog across the uh, frogs and toads, so it won't be a complicated. Should be easy. <laughs> it won't be a complicated <laughs> app here, and we only have you know one that goes really far north. So just keep it south. Um, this is a question from Peter. Uh, post fire, what ecological changes might be expected over the next five to 10 years that would affect, uh, affect rather frog survival and abundance, do you think? A lot. Uh, so I guess the immediate impacts of the fire for a lot of animals um, that we were particularly worried about was increased predation, particularly by invasive species. So now that your frog does, you know, now that I can see more frogs than I could because there's not that much vegetation around, uh, you know, foxes and cats and things going around and just picking off all of the remaining biodiversity, um, you know, all the, all the frogs, all the other mammals and things that survived. So that's something that's of real concern. Um, for then, of course, it's reduced food. So are all the insects and things like that around? Um, are the frogs going to be able to get enough food to eat? Um, you, I don't know if it made it to the news in Canada, but certainly in for mammals, for some threatened mammals that were affected by fire, there was uh, a, a supermarket got involved in in donating sweet potatoes and carrots and dropping them over the places where these um, wallabies were, so that they were able to get something to eat. So there was some short term kind of um, management there. Uh, weed invasion is a big problem as well that potentially make habitat unsuitable. So uh, I guess now a lot of the vegetation has gone, it's, it's easier for, for weeds to get in. Um, and, and of course, habitat structure, we don't know what impact it's gonna have on disease. Um, potentially, it might actually uh, be a benefit for frogs that are affected by the amphibian chytrid fungus because it will open up the habitat in the short term, but in the long term, maybe it'll make it more um, more covered. So yeah, there's there's a lot of really complex interactions, and I think what we're going to find is that there's going to be you know um, you know no no single response is going to depend on the site and the species. Right. Thank you. Well, I would just ask if there are any more questions for Jody, or or if not, maybe she can uh, go and get a, a nice flat white to uh, be <laughs> not begin her day. She's already been up for hours, but to continue her day. Uh, I've already had two cappuccinos on at maximum caffeine, I think. <laughs> All right. I understand that. All right. Well, I think there are no more questions, but thank you so much for a wonderful talk, Jody. And, and I truly do hope that we can get you up here next year after this god-awful pandemic is over.
Um, we really look forward to it. And uh, I will show you as many of the nine frog species on our property as I can. <laughs> <laughs> I would absolutely love that. It would be such an honor. So yeah, here's to uh, a world where we can travel. Okay, thanks again. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.